Hi, everybody. Do you want to wave to, wave to us? <laughs> Hello. Nice to be here. Jag ska alltid se mig över axeln. Inte prata med främmande män om natten, jag lovar. Jag ska alltid vara på min vakt. Jag ska aldrig glömma det de alla har sagt. Så tack mamma, pappa, fröken och rektorn, tack syster och bror. Listan kan göras väldigt lång och rädslan jag känner är stor. Jag vet inte varför jag blir lack men någonting inne till mig säger att jag är fucked. Här finns inte någon plats och i mitt huvud är det svart som ingen goddamn natt. Det känns som att vi lever i en spegelbild där allt är tvätt emot än vad det borde vara. Är du blind? Jag läste att en av tre kvinnor på jorden kommer bli våldtagen. Misshandlad eller brutalt slagen. Under en hel livstid. Det utgör en miljard kvinnor omkring oss. Lyssna, lagen gör det möjligt att våldta. Också samhället och hur vi uppfostrar våra barn. Sättet som vi ser på kvinnor, på kvinnor och män. Släpp in mig för jag ser att du har dörren på glänt. Vi borde öppna våra sinnen och försöka ge det här tid. För det kommer aldrig någonsin gå om vi inte går emot strid. Jag har blivit galen, lämnad och tagen. Ensam, nersmutsad, avklädd, helt naken. Så var ska det här ta mig fram? När jag är 26 års ålder, aldrig trivs i någons famn. Lyssna hårt mot hårt. Jag sätter min hand mot din hand och lovar mig själv att jag aldrig mer ska vara rädd för en man. Fatta. Hey, hey. Fantastic, ooh, yeah. Oh, oh. Broken tipsy. Oh, oh, oh. Christina Paru. So. Ingenting är som du ska. Du måste fatta. fatta. Det är lite mer jag kan ta. Fatta. Ingenting är som du ska vara. Ah, ah, ah. Låt mig bara vara Så, lyssna Jag är bruten för resten av livet straffar Jag är förbannad på att han aldrig kommer fatta Hur jag än försöker det minne för djupt Att säga jag kommer aldrig vara den där tjejen som du älskade Försök stå på dig, var modig och stark Hur jävla lätt är det när man ändå får sota för allt Vad tar jag vägen? Vad tycker du jag ska gå när mina djupa sår är värda fängelse för han i ett halvår? Är du säker på att det faktiskt har hänt? Hur kan man ställa den frågan till någon som just har fucking kräks? Ligger vaken om natten och hatar min kropp För flera tusen gånger valde jag att inte säga stopp vem ska jag annars lägga skulden på Jag var ung ändå så jävla dum och på Mitt hat äter upp med lust och gå av Fan min kropp är ett skal som jag inte klarar av Så lämna mig ensam Jag dör aldrig själv än att dela denna känsla Försök till tröstande ordet det jag får Men tiden läcker inte sådana här Så Ingenting är som du ska Då måste jag fatta Det är lite mer än jag kan ta Vad vill jag klappa händerna på den här? Ingenting är som du ska vara Låt mig bara vara Okej, lyssna, lyssna Du kan Stoppa din hand i mig Jag sa aldrig nej så jag är din Och du kan göra vad du vill Du kan Ta med dig, jag aldrig blivit tagen Supa ner mig, knulla mig fast jag är avslagen Du kan Kör upp en flaska i min fitta tills jag blöder Skryt om det framför dina boys och dina bröder Är det sånt som du vill lära dina söner Så systrar och mödrar Ha mina bönder Ingenting är som du ska Då måste du fatta Det är lite mer jag kan ta Kom igen och klappa händerna, fortsätt Låt dem höra oss Ingenting är som du ska vara Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So, this is a 
<laughs> jag snackar skit på salongen Gör mig fin på salongen Vaxa ben på salongen Men aldrig mer på salongen Jag blir en ny på salongen Det är ganska dyr på salongen Men jag får extra pris på salongen Så du kan få rabatkupongen Jag vill hänga där gussarna hänger Det är bara det Och på salongen har en kvinna alltid varit i fred Inte han jag gör mig fin För var du fått ifrån Hänger på salongen bara för att det det var det så med tusen miljoner och det gör att vill vara planer som öppnar oss av Det bara var det där som vi låg Det är det jag gör mig fin för det är skärsligt Tyck som mina naglar bara för att det är ärligt Gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på salong Gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på salong Kom in och stötta lite jag gör mig fin, jag plockar bryn Jag manikin, fixar frisyr Det är så skönt att flyva in och bara slappna av I alla världens snöver resa långt i vår roan Att falla burka ner till marken och vi snackar skit Jag möter mina syror, här är alla varandra lys Inget av det är för hej Jag gör det för mig själv Inget av det är för här Häng med jag Gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på salong Gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på, gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på sak, gå på salong They were just going to open our next workshop on violence. And um, Cleo and Christine Amaro, they are sold and hip hop duo and also a part of the collective Fantastic. I think we should give them a second hand. Come on. <laughs> and for now, I'm going to introduce the next, next workshop. First of all, I want to welcome you all here. It is so great to stand here and see all your participants here. And it's a great honor for me to be moderating this next workshop. This Nordic Forum gives us a unique chance to discuss and exchange experience and especially to come up with new actions regarding gender equality. This, fo this workshop, we're going to focus especially on violence. My name is Henrietta Holberg, and I work in an NGO called Dana, where we work on equality and gender-based violence. Today, we're going to listen to six different speakers on this issue. And the first speaker I want to 
introduce to you is Gudrun Jonstatia. She is from Iceland, and she's the spokesperson uh, for Stigamot, the Center of Survivors of Sexual Abuse and Violence. Gudrun is also... She is also the founder of Global Network of Women's Shelter, where she also are on the board of the directors. She's also the founder and chair for Skatana, the umbrella organization of 23 NGOs in Ireland. Iceland. Here, I would like to welcome Gudrun, and she will give a speech on stretching the limits from victimization to empowerment. Welcome to you. What a moment at last to stand here with you. I really can feel the power in the air. It is so important to meet. Dear sisters and brothers, no matter how we count or which research we refer to, Nordic perpetrators are extremely active. They are many and they are dangerous. They have forced thousands of women and their children to disappear from the surface of the earth to hide their identity, isolated from their friends and relatives, often for a long time. No one seems to have the overview of how many they are. To go underground like that, women need approval from authorities who have to agree that living in the Thailand daylight is unbearable for them and that the states are unable to protect them. In 2010, more than 13,000 Nordic perpetrators made women and children become refugees in their own home countries in the Nordic, the paradise of gender equality. They fled to some of the 266 women's shelters run by the Nordic shelter movement Nordic perpetrators spent every year more than 350,000 nights alone because their families are on the run. The Nordic, as the rest of the world, is paralyzed when it comes to violent men. It can be admitted by everyone involved that they can be a life-threatening danger to those they should love, but instead of stopping them, endless effort is made to save those they might hurt hiding them and teaching them how to avoid violence. This is amazing when we think of how we react to other threats in our societies. The logistic way of reacting to a danger is to remove it or make it harmless, not to run away from it. There's a huge resistance to take action against perpetrators. My sisters, I have never understood how perpetrators got such a power. How did they get so untouchable? Why is it accepted? In a perfect world, we would close down the women's shelters and use all our strength and energy to go after them and stop them. We need to go from being reactive. We need to go from being reactive to become proactive. Man's violence against women is the biggest shame in our welfare states. Our justice system is based on the ideology that people are innocent until otherwise proven. To prove gender-based violence is extremely difficult. In Iceland, we know about more than 300 rapes every year, but on average, we can count the sentences on the fingers of one Icelandic woman. If everyone is innocent until they have been sentenced for crime, what does that make of all the women seeking help, speaking out about the violence, reporting it? What do we call it when innocent people are accused of serious crimes? We call it lies. We need to adjust the way we formulate ourselves when we talk about justice. Those who are not sentenced for violence are not proven guilty, but they are not proven innocent either. We need to say it out loud and we need to emphasize it. Otherwise, 
we almost make women criminal when they talk about their experiences. I think all of us can recall endless of times sitting at our kitchen tables, whining about the injustice of the world, filled with anger, frustration, worries and powerlessness over brutal violence, the rape culture, the gender pay gap, the paralyzed justice system. Most often we leave it like that and go on with our everyday life. The magic, the magic sisters happens when we manage to take it further, when we realize that nothing will probably change while we sit and wait, when we understand that we as anyone else can take action, we can be the doers. Otherwise, we too are responsible for status quo. We know that everything ever done was not enough to eliminate men's violence against women. And therefore, we need to realize that to make the world better and bring about justice, more needs to be done and it needs to be done differently. Such a magic happened about 100 years ago when the suffragettes thought it was about time that women got the right to vote. This, they certainly were not the most popular of women. They were radical feminists, they were doers and determined not to give up. Uh, and they were put in jail. They went on hunger strikes, but in the end they succeeded. I sometimes wonder where we would be now without them. The women's strike. Yeah, clap for them. We should always be clapping for the suffragettes. The women's strikes in Iceland is another example of what women can do if they network and instead of just complain, claim their rights. Uh, in Iceland, in 2010, uh, women had a strike for the last time. We have two-thirds of men's total salaries. The average working day is from 9 to 5 o'clock. That means in a country where people are supposed to have equal salary, women have done their share at 14.25. After that, we are doing voluntary work every single working day. And why should we? On October 25th, uh, in a huge storm and minus 10 degrees, women decided to do their share and then at 14.55 leave work and gather in the center of Reykjavik. We demanded equal pay and a society free of violence. In our micro community, 50,000 women showed up. What a power! You might ask, and what for? Did we close the pay gap? No, we didn't. Did we end violence? No, we didn't either do that. But we confirmed the solidarity amongst us. We confirmed that the burning issues that unite us are the pay gap and our desire to live in peace without violence. We confirmed that when we are many, we are capable of claiming our rights. I feel the urge to solve our problems, to find solutions. We need provocating women, activists, academics, democrats, a lively grassroots, some fun and a real movement. If we so much as blink an eye on the WhatsApp, a screaming silence takes over. A creative work a creative way to work is to be in touch with our feelings of justice. We have often reason to become furious and worried. It's okay, it's logistic, but just don't stop there. We need to turn our anger into actions. You know, we always have a choice between the role of the victim and empowerment. I learned it when I was a little girl. I learned it from another little girl from Sweden. She lived a horrible life. She was neglected and abandoned. She didn't attend school and she lived alone. Luckily, it never crossed her mind that she might be in the role of a victim. Um, 
the name of this little redhead girl was Pepe Langstrom. See, Pepe Langstrom was not bothered by traditions or the strict rules that we too often thoughtlessly follow. She invented her own rules, her own style, her own ways of living. What a role model for us. Dear sisters, I felt I should tell you how to end violence, but I can't. I don't know how. Anything ever done was not enough. More needs to be done, and it has to be done differently. I know that men's violence against us women is a burning issue for the thousands of us that found the way to Malmo. A wild, strong women's movement is the sharpest and best tool I know to promote change. Let's strengthen our networks. Let's join forces. Let's learn from each other. Let's empower each other. Let's have some fun. That's the best we can do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gudrun. Thank you. And before I present the next speaker, I just want to remind you, if you are tweeting, you can tweet on the hashtag NF2014. The next speaker I want to introduce is Gail Dines. <laughs> Gail Dine is a professor uh, of uh, Dr. Gail Dine is a professor of sociology and women's studies at Wheatlock College at, in Boston. For over 20 years, Gail has researching and writing about sexuality, porn industry, and pop culture. She is the founding president of Stop Porn Culture, whose mission is to challenge the pornography industry. Her latest book, Porn Land, How Porn Has Hijacked Our Sexuality, has been the best-selling book in 2010. She will give the speech, pornography, the production and consumption of inequality. Please welcome Gail. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you everyone for organizing this. And my talk comes with a trigger warning for people because it's got pornographic um, images in it and discussion. So, I have been a radical feminist for as long as I can remember. And as I witness the marginalization of radical feminism in the cultural discourse, in publishing and in women's studies, I see the feminist movement that I once loved become powerless to explain what is happening to women, especially the horrific levels of male violence against women. This failure reached new levels following the massacre by Elliot Rogers two weeks ago in California, where he went on a killing spree of students, mainly women, because according to him, they were sluts who didn't deserve to live. The media was on fire with women and some men, writing about misogyny as the cause, as if this explains why Roger targeted young women and rambled on about sluts refusing to date him. Like most women, I felt enraged, depressed, and overwhelmed by what, by what is now an all too common cultural practice, male violence against women. The one positive thing to come out of this massacre was that the word misogyny was finally becoming everyday vocabulary but the way it was discussed and explained by the mainstream media and mainstream feminists only added to my rage. Misogyny has become the catch-all term to explain why men murder women, and that explanation is true as far as it goes. But if we see misogyny as an ideology, then the key question that we have to ask, and one that is rarely asked, is where are the norms, values, and beliefs of misogyny coming from. Unless we believe that men are born misogynists and feminists know only too well how dangerous the biology is destiny argument is for us, then as feminists we need to explain why some men hate women enough to rape, maim and kill us. Blaming misogyny without delving into its causes 
is lazy social theory and will limit, if not bankrupt, our activism because we will fail to organize against those who are most dangerous to us. Misogyny is not something created out of thin air. To be caught much like a cold that drives those infected to commit horrendous acts of violence. Misogyny is an ideology produced and disseminated by social and cultural institutions that work seamlessly together to create a social reality that normalizes, legitimizes, and glorifies violence against women. Radical feminists, many of whom cut their teeth in the US anti-war movement of the 70s, develop theories and activism based on an institutional understanding of how ideas are created and circulated through the culture. We understood that women are seen as a class by men, a class to be oppressed through sexual terrorism. Sexual terrorism that includes rape, incest, battery, prostitution, trafficking, porn, and ultimately mass murder. Understanding women as a group with a collective class interest stems from a critical understanding of how power works and how it is produced minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. Karl Marx was one of the first theorists to explain that ideology is not a free-floating set of ideas, but rather a coherent system of beliefs that are purposely and carefully created by the elite class to promote their interests. Using their ownership of key cultural institutions, the elite then set about distributing these ideas until these ideas become the dominant ways of thinking. The more I read about Roger's unspeakable massacre in California, the more frustrated I became with the unwillingness of mainstream feminist movement to take on the elephant in the room, a well-resourced, multi-billion dollar a year industry that doesn't just produce misogyny, but actually ties it in with male arousal and ejaculation. Mainstream porn has now become so violent that when radical feminists like me describe it in debates and presentations, we are accused by people, often by other feminists who should know better, of exaggerating and only focusing on the very worst. In the best case scenario, this is because mainstream feminists have never actually spent much time on mainstream porn. And in the worst case, it is a willful desire to not rock the boat with boyfriends, husbands, brothers, publishers, and tenure committees. So here is a test, and one that comes once again with a trigger warning. I am going to quote extensively from a popular website that was made even more popular by the outing of a Duke University student, Bella Knox, as a porn star. We all know her name, or at least her porn name, but does anyone know the name of the porn site where she was gagged with a penis almost to unconsciousness, smeared with semen to the point that she couldn't open her eyes, slapped and penetrated so roughly that she was gasping in pain and sobbing? At one point, she was pushing the male performer slash abuser away because she couldn't breathe. And in typical porn sex behavior, he dragged her closer to his penis, yanking her hair, spitting in her face and screaming at her to shut the fuck up. This site is called facial abuse and the images and the videos that populate it can only be described as torture. With no pretense that this is about consensual or mutually enjoyable sex, the text describes an unbearable detail what they are doing to women. And I'm now going to quote from the site. Big tits, check. Airhead, check. Daddy issues, check. Brooke Ultra has all the makings of being the next big deal in big tit porn. I can totally see why porn companies are gobbling up this cunt, but we had a first. Today, she was trained to be a submissive little whore, taking cocks in all three holes. Paulie Harker blew her asshole out with his giant knob. We shot some great fucking anal gapes with this pig, so much that you could see what she had for dinner last night. Enjoy this, and when you see her all over the place, Remember who taught this cunt the ropes. 
While most social and political institutions create women-hating ideology, name me one other that delivers it in such crisp, succinct, unambiguous manner. Name one media institution that prides itself on torturing women as its very reason for existence. Porn produces an ideology that makes women seem disposable sluts who are undeserving of dignity, bodily integrity, or the slightest shred of empathy. Whatever psychological disorder Rogers had, he was sane enough to internalize the pornographic ideologies so perfectly embodied in facial abuse and thousands of other websites like that. Mainstream commentators and feminists tie themselves in knots trying to avoid any discussion of the way porn is implicated in violence against women. They talk about porn as, quote, empowering, as fun, as a celebration of women's sexual agency, and then express outrage when men act out the women-hating messages that are the core elements of pornography. So let us take a closer look at this industry that is now the major form of sex education in the Western world. Studies show that the average age of first viewing porn for boys is between 11 and 14, at the very time they're developing their sexual identity. Porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. Porn makes up 36% of the internet, and one third of all downloads contain porn. There are more than a billion porn web pages and 68 million daily porn search engine requests. And one of the most popular search engine requests in the, year, in the world is teen porn. This is a business with considerable political clout that interfaces with credit card companies, mobile phone companies, search engines, satellite and cable companies, venture capitalists, hotels, and real estate developers, to name a few. Any industry this size, whether it sells food, cars, or clothing, is going to shape the social, economic, cultural, and political landscape that we all inhabit. To suggest otherwise is to ignore the power that capitalist industries have in molding human behavior. The fashion industry shapes the way we dress, the food industry the way we eat, and the sex industry the way we think about and have sex. How can it not, given that it is the main producer of ideologies about gender, sex, and sexuality? These degrading and misogynist images have become the wallpaper of the lives of young people, robbing them of an authentic, healthy sexuality that is a basic right of every human being. Websites with names like Gog on my, Gag on my Cock, Suck Me Bitch, Ghetto Gaggers and Human Toilet Bowls make clear that today's porn is about making hate to women's bodies with sex acts designed to deliver the maximum amount of brutality, humiliation and degradation. On one site advertising the movie Annually Ripped Whores, the text reads, and I quote, we at Pure Filth know exactly what you want and we're giving it to you. Chicks being ass fucked till their sphincters are pink, puffy and totally blown out. Adult diapers just might be in store for these whores when their work is done. Before you think I spent hours looking for the worst examples, you should know that I got to all of these within 20 seconds of going onto Pornhub, the most well-known porn site in the world. Most of the porn produced is within a capitalist industrial concept, complex, setting which does not do to sex what fast food industry does to food. It commodifies it, and you end up with a product that is generic, formulaic, and plasticized totally lacking in creativity, imagination, authenticity, and individuality. This is what it means when a product is industrialized. And this is why it is ridiculous to suggest that being anti-porn is the same as being anti-sex. When I criticize... Very good. When I criticize McDonald's, no one accuses me of being anti-eating since people understand that I'm critiquing an industry, not a human act. In porn, women are not human beings who need good jobs, safe housing, equal pay, or free daycare. No, in porn, women are, according to the pornographers, a bunch of whores, sluts, cunts, cum dumpsters who need nothing more than a good fucking. These cum dumpsters have no bodily integrity, limits, or desires outside of being fucked. And whatever men want to do, surprise, she wants it. It is a perfect pre-feminist world where, women do, where men do not have to deal with pushy, 
mouthy, ambitious women who nag about pesky things like equal rights, abortion rights, sexual violence, fair pay and childcare. In porn land, boys can be boys, where they don't have to deal with women because there are no women in porn, only girls, lots and lots of them, and they are disposable because once you finish with one, then comes another and another and another. Now, the problem with this is that these men who use porn are the very ones who run the fucking world. They are the politicians, the lawyers, the bankers, and the economists. And they decide how women and children are going to live and die. They're going to make laws and policy about equal pay, rape, battery, access to welfare, housing and education. And what do you think when they see a woman? Do they see a full, equal human being? Or do they see a fuck object who has a sell-by date stamped on a forehead? So, before we all celebrate just how empowered women are today, what with our feminist porn and endless choices to be strippers and prostitutes, let me give you a dose of reality. On a global scale, women perform 66% of the world's work, produce 50% of the food, earn 10% of the income, and own less than 1% of the property. Clearly, it is not only in porn that women are fucked. This has to change. This has to change, and the only way it is going to change is if we wrestle power away from the men. We have to stop giving them total and complete power over women's bodies and lives. Radical feminists who make porn a central part of our activism are not, and pick your slur, anti-sex, prudish, man-haters, censors, or ugly bitches who are jealous of porn stars. Rather, we fight the porn industry because we know that as long as this tsunami of women-hating ideology continues to shape masculinity, there will be never-ending supply of Elliot Rogers laying in wait for his next batch of victims. Porn tells men lies about women. It tells them that women don't matter. It tells men that they have unquestionable rights to do whatever they want to us. It tells them that they have nothing to fear from us because we will not fight back. Patriarchy tells men that we will not miss all this woman energy that men have destroyed. But sisters, they are wrong. We miss these women. They are our sisters, they are our daughters, and we want them back. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you, Gail, and you. I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. We will uh, have the pleasure to discuss uh, in the panel discussion with Gail later. So let me move on. The next I would like to present is Ida Östensen. She's the founder and chairperson of the organization Crossing Borders. Crossing Borders works for equality and creates new possibilities for an equal and inclusive society. They are doers instead of talkers and they are creating change with inspiration and methods. Ida is also the co-founder of FATA in collaboration with Fantastic, who fights against sexual violence and for consent. She's going to give us a speech on the subject how a campaign with music as a tool can put consent at the top of a political agenda. Please welcome Ida. In uh, my last year, the artists you enjoyed earlier here on stage, Natalie Cleo Misawi from the collective Fantastic, opened a newspaper and read about yet another acquittal in a rape, ca in a rape case, the so-called bottle rape. There was quotes such as, the girl pinching her legs together was a sign of shyness. And they did, after all, stop penetrating her when she started bleeding so they did not necessarily have any malicious or evil intent. And when she didn't think it could get any worse, there was a big ad on the same page. A wine bottle with the word recommended written across it. Natalie posted the picture on Facebook. I replied, what the hell should we do? I feel so damn powerless. 
we started chatting about ideas. And four days later, we met. And that was the start of what today has put the issue of consent at the top of the political agenda, the FATA movement. FATA, which means get it, started with collecting stories about sex that happened without consent. The stories were interpreted into a song to which we released with a music video in September last year in combination with a newspaper article. This was the start of a grassroots movement. Within one year, FATA has managed to make an issue no party prioritized into one of the most important issues in Swedish politics. The issue of sexual violence affects everyone. By combining culture and politics, we strive to reach as many as possible. FATA has made it easy for people to participate in opinion making. FATA has given people a political voice and lowered the, the barriers to those in power. My name is Ida Stenson, and I'm the founder of Crossing Borders Foundation. I started Crossing Borders because I felt that gender and equality were often well described with words, but without practical solutions. Crossing Borders works only with solutions, and that's why I'm so pleased that this session focuses on strategies, demands and solutions for an equal society. In my vision, I will use one simple rule. To do everything we do today but the opposite, we need to flip the current order. I hope you're ready to challenge your thoughts and your action, because here comes number one out of seven. Number one, today we have a society that from birth gives our children one alternative, the pink or the blue one. I dream of a society that gives all children the entire rainbow. We have to have a norm critical pedagogy within every education. Number two, today we read about absurd acquittals that shows what extreme specifics our justice system has regarding sexually related crimes. Representatives from the judiciary says that education in norm criticism and men's violence would remove their objectivity. I dream of a society where everyone understands that knowledge would of course increase the possibility, possibility of unbiased and fair trials. For conception about sex, gender, and sexuality, not to hamper correct and objective assessments, there must be a mandatory education within the judiciary and law enforcement. From individual police officers all the way to the judges in Högsta domstolen, the Swedish Supreme Court. Number three. Today, non-profit organizations are being forced to pull resources, resources out of thin air to be able to work with preventative and supportive uh, care against sexual violence. That is a sad testimonial that so many girls and women's lives fall outside of our collective welfare system. I dream of a society where our social welfare is also based on girl, girls and women's needs. Number four, today we talk about girls' vulnerability and teach girls to set boundaries, to say no, not to walk outside late at night, to be careful. I dream of a society where we instead teach boys to draw those boundaries, to say no when their friends cross those boundaries, <laughs> to learn how to act in public spaces late at night and to be more careful. It is boys and men who need to learn that anything else than a yes is a no. For this, we need to make space and allocate resources for meeting young boys and men. Let the girls in middle school go out and play soccer, while the boys talk about feelings, relationships, and to learn to draw those boundaries. Let the responsibility lie where it belongs, with the boys and men. Number five. <laughs> Today, teenagers learn about sex through porn 
And at the same time, schools awkwardly try to educate about anatomy and biology in a few short lessons. They are taught how to use a condom in heterosexual sex. It is not enough. I dream about the sexual education which responds to teenagers' real needs. It must be equally important to be educated in sexuality education as it is to be, for instance, in advanced math in order to be allowed to teach in our schools. Number six, today we have a society where it's taboo to talk about sexual violence, where she who has been subjected to sexual violence becomes a liar or a whore, where the time after the rape is called the second rape. We have a society where our ideas about masculinity can make it even harder for young guys who are victims to tell someone and ask for help. We have a society where adults are afraid to see what is happening and therefore deny the fact that their own child could be a part of the statistics. I dream of a society where everyone dares to see the signs, dare to ask and take the time to listen. Number seven, every year around 6,000 rape charges are filed in Sweden. And at the same time, Brottsförebyggande Rådet, the Swedish uh, National Cons Council for uh, Crime Prevention, estimates around 36,000 rapes every year. That comes down to 100 rapes a day. This is a clear sign that people have lost their faith in judiciary and choose not to file charges in order to avoid humiliation. I dream that legislation, instead of always being one step behind the rest of the society, could in the future be ahead of it. FATA demands a sexual crime legislation based on consent. Sex without consent is not sex. A sexual crime legislation built upon consent has a normative effect on society's views on sex. We do not live in an equal society today, but I dream about an equal society. But to get there, we must all understand that we have a collective and individual responsibility to act and to dare to challenge ourselves and just think the opposite and flip the current order. And we have to do that now. Thank you. Thank you, Ida. The next speaker on this stage is Dorit Otzen, who is a project manager for the Swan Groups at the shelter and organization The Nest International in Denmark. She's also the founder of the Exit Prostitution Programs in Denmark. For more than 20 years, Doyd Otzen was the head of The Nest, which is an independent private institution working to eliminate trafficked women and prostitution. The Nest International includes a shelter, counseling and outreach work in the streets of Copenhagen, amongst other services. Today, Dorit will give a speech on prostitution as an act of violence. Please welcome Dorit. Thank you. Hello, everyone. In the Nordic countries, there are laws which protect women in the homes, in the workplace, in public areas. You are not allowed to expose us to violence. You are not allowed to expose us to sexual harassment. You are not allowed to expose us to racism, and you are not allowed to rape us. These laws can lose their power for a very small amount when it comes to buying a woman in prostitution. Then violence is no longer violence, sexual harassment is no longer sexual harassment, and racism is no longer racism. And rape is no longer rape, but only a part of the business of prostitution. To maintain that particular view that a group of societies, women should be at service to fulfill men's sexual needs, it keeps a group of women in a situation where they are no longer protected by national or international laws on, regarding basic human rights. 
the Icelandic anthropologist Gisli Atlason, who conducted a study why Danish men by prostitution, believes that the way men and women's sexuality is defined depends on the amount of prostitution that takes place in each country, and that gender equality depends on this. I have for more than 40 years worked as a social worker among women in all forms of prostitution that exist, and I have to agree with him. Men can, for a small amount of money, buy the right to use a woman to live out every sexual fantasy. He knows what he can get women to do for a small amount of money, and he is not at work or back at home working for equality between men and women. In autumn 2012, the Danish government decided, despite of earlier promises, not to follow the Nordic countries and introduce a law criminalizing the purchase of sexual service. The Danish government has hereby accepted that men should have the continuous right to sexual access to other people's bodies against payment. Why do we accept it happens? To legitimize the and create distance, we call them by names. The woman is no longer a woman, but becomes horse, slut, the sexual immoral. We call her the prostitute, as if it was genetic, and not an act committed by women that for many reasons could not see other options. Sweden, Norway, and Iceland had no doubt about the unequal power relations and look at prostitution as violence against women. All three countries have long criminalized the right to bisexual access to other people's bodies. Finland has taken the first step and banned the purchase of victims of trafficking, while, as in Denmark, with a clear conscience and legal legality, making it possible to continue to buy national women for prostitution. A Danish writer, O. Paulson, who had experience from prostitution from brothels, escort, defined prostitution as follows. Being a prostitution is being a body that can be bent in joints, legs spread out, open your mouth and receive the customer's imagination. You have to smile and create the illusion the man expects. The illusion that you love sex. You love having sex with many men every single day. Just the macho porno like way that many men want after seeing how women in porn movies will take it all. Out of a population of about 5.5 million in Denmark, 1.5% of the Danish men are buying prostitution. The, Ameri the American uh, Siddharth Kara, who has written the book Sex Trafficking Inside the Business of Modern Slavery, has made a cal calculation of how long a man has to work to get money to buy a woman for prostitution. An Indian has to work two and a half hours. An Italian must work 2.2 hours. An American must work 1.4 hours, it means 75 minutes. A Danish man has to work even less. The many foreign women, which represent more than 50% of all prostitution in Denmark, keeps prices for prostitution at such a low level. Then on the street you can buy a blowjob for 10 euro and a sexual intercourse for 13 to 25 euros, which even a schoolboy can afford. There are people who have, only have their body left to sell. So we buy the corners, kidneys of the poor, make them surrogates for the kids we cannot give birth to, and we buy the women and children for our own sexual gratification. We buy access to the genital openings, to the anuses, the vaginas, and the mouth. Why? Because it's possible. Because it's legal, answered 60% of more than 6,000 of the men in a large Danish study of Danish men's prostitution habits. Because it's causal, causal sex, answered 36% of the men. But none of the Danish men in the study mentioned the violence, which is surprising when we know that the risk of violence is omnipresent in prostitution. If the reason why it's not mentioned is because none of the more than 6,000 are perpetrators, or if it is because it's even more taboo to be perpetrators of violence than it is to be prostitution buyers, is a question. We know that violence is a term in prostitution. In a Swedish study, 50%, more than 50% of women have experienced violence, such as rape, sadistic treatment, and abuse. A Danish study showed that among women in the brothels, 
many of them have uh, broken agreements and the boundaries were constantly crossed. Men who buy sex, who they buy and what they buy is the title of a recent British study. 50% of those men believe that the women were tricked, cheated or trafficked into prostitution. Nevertheless, it didn't hold them back from buying sex from women, which for many of whom could be called sex slaves. One of the most important things you can say about men who buy prostitution is that they buy the power to personally define what is sold and what it is they are buying. Both Danish men and women define men's right to purchase prostitution. For where else will he go with his need for sexual relief, him, the man who had a hard time with women? Him, the fat one, the stupid one, the weird one, the odd guy, or the disabled man, or the man who is far away from home. For his sake, prostitution should be an option. Though a Danish study shows that 64% of Danish men who buy prostitution live in a relationship with a woman, so it may well be that he is fat, stupid, an outsider, disabled, and has difficulties with women, but we are all married to him. He's our husband or he's our boyfriend. <laughs> what does it do to the relationship between men and women when the website like Hedomax exists? A website where men buy prostitution can review their purchase as if it were a pair of trainees or a mobile phone. In one example, a man says, that was fucking great. Her, the tie hooker, had such a tight hole that I could not get my cock in without hurting her. It was fucking great. It can be recommended. Another man says, bad, 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 I thought, as Annette opened the door. I could not get it up running in her company. She was too old. The her time in the industry was out. And the third ad, just visited Maya. And can I importantly not recommend that slot? She is not nearly as hot as in the pictures, does not smell good, and her morning was too fake to make the product a cool experience. Bad experience and a waste of money. Equality between women and men suffers as we accept prostitution as a normal behavior. It is unacceptable for all countries who call themselves the democracies of, of, of equality to accept men's sexual exploitation of women by accepting brothel, street prostitution, escort prostitution, and all other forms of prostitution. Unfortunately, Denmark is one of those countries where women are put for sale and purchased equally with other trade objects. For me, prostitution is mainly a cultural phenomenon, albeit rooted in social, economic, and structural problems. Though with a positive aspect, the cultural phenomenon may change over time. And here I lies my hope for the future. With my many years of experience in social work, I do not see prostitution as a benefit for anyone or anything, but rather a disaster to the whole community. As long as mankind can be reduced to a commodity to be bought and sold, and as long as a country can accept that their women are a commodity, just as long will equal equality between women and men be a distant dream for the future. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs> and we will move straight on to the next speaker on this stage. Our next speaker is Kaiser Eikis Ekman. She is a cultural journalist, commentator and an author. In 2011, she published the book Being and Being Bought, Prostitution, Surrogacy and the Split Self, in which she examines the surrogacy and the discriminalization of sex trade and the division of the woman as female being and female commodity. She will give a speech on babies for sale, women for rent, the surrogacy industry. Please welcome Kaiser. Thank you. Hello, how are you? I don't hear anything. <laughs> You're not dead, I hope. You still have some time to listen. Um, we just heard about prostitution, and I'm going to be speaking about another type of prostitution, namely surrogacy, or contract pregnancy. 
Um, this is a growing industry globally that could be described as prostitution's little sister. Um, it has all the similarities with prostitution, but it's not as big yet, but it's growing globally, especially in places like the US, Ukraine, and India. Um, this can also be described as a kind of inverted prostitution. In prostitution, um, the idea is sex and no baby. The prostitute is there to deliver sex, but it's very important that no babies will come out of this encounter. Whereas in surrogacy, the point is to create a baby, but without sex. Um, it works this way that a woman is inseminated or there is an embryo transplant. Um, she's giving a lot of hormones. Uh, it's a very painful process. In places like India, you often put in three or four embryos and then take away the ones you don't want. Um, after she's given birth, uh, she receives a sum of money. So basically we're talking about giving birth for money, delivering babies for money. Um, I'm asking, what is that if it's not baby trade? The buyers generally are rich people, often from the West. Um, the majority is heterosexual couples. Um, second category, homosexual male couples. Third category, single males, who all want a baby related genetically to them. Um, the sellers are, of course, women, generally lower class, third world. Um, in all cases of surrogacy, you have a class difference. Uh, many of you have heard of the theory intersectionality. Well, I'm telling you, surrogacy is the place to apply that theory. If you look at surrogacy, you have all the categories. We're talking about class, uh, ethnicity, gender, um, sexuality, all comes together in the practice of surrogacy. It's rich people from the West, generally men, using poor women uh, of a lower class or from the third world to create babies. But whereas prostitution is increasingly being called exploitation, abuse, patriarchy, surrogacy has quite a different image. You know, we hear about a rosy family being created thanks to surrogacy. Um, and curiously, at the same time as we hear in surrogacy about you know, the typical, perfect, nuclear, heterosexual family, we also hear that surrogacy um, is able to give us, you know, the alternative family ideal. So the interesting thing is that here, we're conflating in the discourse uh, pro-surrogacy, the arch-conservative idea of a woman as a breeder, you know, the woman's only duty in life is to create babies, basically. This conflated with a postmodern relativist idea of, you know, the right to choose. And this is like the first and foremost argument that the pro-surrogacy people use, you know. It's um, women's right to choose. And remember one thing, in patriarchy, the woman who chooses her own subordination is always going to be called the strong woman by default. Um, Thank you. Sweden has been slow in reacting to surrogacy. I'm very sad to say that although we were the forerunners in um, combating prostitution, we were the first to have the law against purchase of sexual services. When it comes to surrogacy, we're unfortunately going the other way. Uh, our parliament uh, recently uh, launched an investigation in order to possibly legalize surrogacy in Sweden, which I totally deplore. Because if you think that prostitution is bad and surrogacy is good, can you not see that there are two sides of the same coin? That they represent the old dichotomy between the whore and the Madonna, where we say that the prostitute is the whore, that's bad. Surrogacy, that's the Madonna, that's good. No, it's the same thing. Of course there are differences. Thank you. There are, of course, differences. In surrogacy, you don't have the same amount of violence. Obviously, you're not going to abuse or beat up a woman who's carrying the child that you paid a million Swedish crowns for. You know, that would be ridiculous. You're destroying the product, so to say. Um, there isn't the same amount of drug abuse. But the reification, the commodification, the turning of women into products is the same. And the turning of babies into products is another thing that surrogacy has that prostitution doesn't have. 
Another thing that um, combines these two industries is the fact that the woman's body is used for someone else. It's not for her own sake. Um, when uh, in prostitution you have sex with a person that you don't like and that you're not excited about, you know, you have to turn off your own body not to feel. In surrogacy, when you for nine months carry a baby that you will never see again after giving birth, you also have the technique uh, which uh, testimonies from surrogate mothers you know, have shown that you have to turn off the feelings you have for the child in order not to suffer when you uh, give it away after giving birth. So the same thing applies for these two industries. We're talking about reducing women to whores or Madonnas, reducing women to sex or reproduction, reducing women to their bodily functions, not caring about how we feel up here, how we feel in our hearts. That's not important. The point in prostitution is you're there for sex. The point in surrogacy is you're there to deliver a baby. What you feel for the baby doesn't matter. You know, women are turned into products. And I'm saying, you know, that's why surrogacy is absolutely incompatible with equality, with women's autonomy. Um, I want to tell you guys something, you know, what are women for? That's a rhetorical question, obviously. Women are for ourselves. When we have sex, it's supposed to be for us because we want it, right? If we have babies, it shouldn't be for any other reason than the fact that we want it. Not for money, not for force, or not for the typical thing that you're feeling so sorry for a man that you will do anything for him just to make him happy. Um, I will call on all of you to act against surrogacy. I'm begging you, please raise your voice against surrogacy. The people who are acting internationally against surrogacy are very few. We're like this many. We're like 10 people talking out against surrogacy. This cannot go on. If all of you who are sitting right here did something against surrogacy, we can raise an international movement and actually start combating this industry. If we don't do that now, we're going to have a monster at our hands, you know, comparable with the trafficking industry. And by then, it's going to be very difficult to stop because we're also talking about the money that's going to be in it. So please act. Thank you. Thank you. See you later in the yes, panel definitely. discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have uh, reached to the final speaker here today. And I would like to present Jackson Catch. He's a PhD, an American author, educator, filmmaker, and cultural theorist who is internationally recognized as a pioneer in gender, gender violence prevention education. In 1993, he co-founded the Mentor in Violence Prevention, one of the most widely implemented and influential sexual and relationship abuse prevention programs in schools, in sport cultures, and in the U.S. military. The MVP introduced the bystander approach to gender violence prevention field. And Katz is one of the key architects of this now broadly popular approach. He's also the author of The Macho Paradox, Why Some Men Hurt Women, and How All Men Can Help. And also the author of the book, Leading Men, Presidential Campaigns, and the Politics of Manhood. He lectures extensively in the U.S. and around the world. He's going to speak on men's violence is also a men's issue. Please welcome Jackson Katz. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you very much, Henrietta. Thank you all. Um, before I begin my prepared comments, I want to say this is a Honestly, it's a great honor for me to be here and to be part of this conference. I want to really thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to be part of this. Um, it's inspiring, to say the least. And I really, as a, as a sort of a life moment, this is, this is great stuff. So thank you. I've worked a lot in Scandinavia over the past five years or so with Men for Gender Equality and other women and men in Sweden and elsewhere who have uh, brought me over. And I wouldn't probably be here were it not for there advocacy and leadership, so I thank them as well. I also want to say that I'm part of a growing movement of men in the 
in the North America and Europe and all over the world, really, in a multicultural, multi-ethnic sense, a growing movement of men who are finally beginning to take women's leadership ideas and, um, and moral um, lesson, if you will, and going into parts of male culture that have historically been either apathetic about or openly hostile to women's efforts to engage them. We're going into parts of male culture, the sports culture, the military cultures, the in schools, and in other bastions of male power, and talking about men's violence and challenging other men to start standing up and speaking out with women as our friends and our partners and our allies, not as our antagonists in somehow this fictional battle between the sexes that so many people understand these issues to be. And I, part of my work is to break down that artificial nature of this as women against men or men against women. We live in the world together. Our our lives are inextricably interwoven. Every issue that affects women affects men by definition, as does every issue that affects men affects women by definition. And by the way, I just use the gender binary. I understand there's more people in the world than men and women. It's a more expansive gender binary than the gender binary. But I'm going to say, to begin my prepared remarks, that we need a paradigm shift in our thinking and our understanding about the issues of gender violence. When I say gender violence, I'm talking about sexual assault, domestic violence, sexual harassment, the sexual abuse of children, that whole range of issues that I'll refer to in shorthand as gender violence issues. They've been seen as women's issues that some good men help out with. But I'm here to say that I don't accept that frame. I don't see these issues in that way. I, I don't see these as women's issues that some good men help out with. In fact, I'm gonna argue that these are men's issues, first and foremost. And if we have any hope of dramatically reducing the levels of violence perpetrated by men against women and children and other men in the world, if we have any hope of doing that, we have to have this paradigm shift and see it centrally as about men and men's engagement and men's leadership, which I'll get to in a few moments. Now, let me, having said that, let me say, men's leadership is building on women's leadership. I'm not saying that men need to take over from women. No one that I know and the people that, with whom I work thinks that or believes that or acts on that. It's not about taking over from women. It's about shifting the, the, the burden of responsibility onto the shoulders where it should be, which is on the men who are in power and the men who are committing the acts of violence. Calling domestic and sexual violence a women's issue is another form of victim blaming. It's putting it on the shoulders of the victims to, to respond. It's putting it on the shoulders of the victims to organize, to, 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 to agitate, to politic politicize. And that's not fair, to say the least, is it? So this paradigm shift is fundamental to what we need to do um, going forward. By the way, the term gender, people hear the word gender, right? They think so they, a lot of people think that the word gender means women. So anytime you have a conversation where gender is in the title, and it's not a mandatory event, in other words, you hope people will show up, if the word gender is in the title, who shows up? It's overwhelmingly women. Most people see gender issues as synonymous with women's issues. There's some confusion about the term gender, and, 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 and let me illustrate that confusion by way of analogy, okay? So let's talk for a moment about uh, race. And I'm going to use the United States, my home as the uh, reference point, but you can plug in Scandinavian analogs, right? So let's talk about race for a moment. In the U.S., when people hear the word race, they tend to think it means African-American, uh, Latino, Asian-American, Native American, South Asian, Pacific Islander. Or when people hear the word sexual orientation, they tend to think it means gay, lesbian, bisexual. And when people hear the word gender, they tend to think it means women. In each case, the dominant group doesn't get paid attention to. As if white people don't have some sort of racial identity or belong to some racial category or construct. As if heterosexual people don't have a sexual orientation. As if men don't have a gender. This is one of the ways that dominant systems maintain and reproduce themselves. Which is to say the dominant group is rarely challenged to even think about its dominance because that's one of the key characteristics of power and privilege. The ability to go unexamined, lacking introspection. or self-awareness, in fact being rendered invisible in parts of the discourse about issues that are often centrally about us. And it's amazing how this works in domestic and sexual violence, how men have been so often erased from the very conversation. I'll give you a handful of examples of what I'm talking about. You'll hear people ask questions like, how many women in Sweden were raped last year? Not how many men raped women. Or you'll hear people say, 
how many girls in the Malmo school district were harassed or abused last year, not how many boys harassed or abused girls, or in, how many girls harassed or abused girls. You'll hear people say things like in Denmark, how many teenage girls got pregnant last year, not how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls. In each case, the use of the passive voice has a very powerful political effect. The political effect is the shift in focus off of the dominant group and onto the subordinated group. And that's not a coincidence or an accident. It's not sloppy use of language. It's how power functions. In this case, through invisibility and stealth. And so part of our challenge... Those of us who are trying to shift the paradigm is to make visible what has been rendered invisible. And that's uphill. It's an uphill challenge. Even the term violence against women is problematic. You never hear me say the term violence against women. What's missing? The active agent is missing. It's just a bad thing that happens to women, violence against them. But if you insert the active agent, men, you have a new phrase, men's violence against women. It doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, but it's more accurate and it's more honest, isn't it? Now, by the way, the old paradigm, the old paradigm plays out all the time in the mainstream media conversation about these issues. So, for example, at the Video Music Awards last year when Miley Cyrus and Robin Thicke were performing, so much of the conversation after that performance was about Miley Cyrus and how she might be a bad role model for girls or something. Very little discussion about Robin Thicke, who produced and wrote and, and starred in Blurred Lines. <laughs> the, the, right? Very little discussion about Robin Thicke. What is, what is, is he a good role model for boys or girls? But the discussion was focused on Miley Cyrus. That's the old paradigm, right? The old paradigm is to talk about trafficked women and children rather than the men who buy sex. You turn it around. Instead of focusing on the victims all the time, focusing on the perpetrators. If we have, again, if we have any hope of transforming the culture that produces victimization, this is what we need to do. I mean, we need to take care of victims and survivors. We need resources and we need, you know, support. But that's not the same as the cultural transformation that will prevent the victimization in the first place. And for that, we need the paradigm shift. Now, some of you might have paid attention, might be paying attention to the news that comes out of the United States on a regular basis of school shootings and rampage killings, which happen all the time in my country. Right? Well, you know what the mainstream conversation about school shootings and rampage killings is in the United States? It's about kids killing kids. It's about what's going on with our young people. What's going on with youth. It's very rare that you see a gender-specific conversation about school shootings, which are overwhelmingly perpetrated by young men and boys. Right? Can you imagine if girls committed 99% of school shootings? Anybody talking about kids killing kids? The first thing they would be talking about would be What's going on with girls? And, and what is it about cultural ideologies of femininity that are leading some, a small percentage, a tiny percentage, but some who are giving us an indication of what's going on in a larger sense? That would be the first thing people would be talking about. But because it's boys and men, we degender it and talk about kids and young people. And we don't get anywhere in terms of coming up with um, both understanding of the causes and then what to do about it. In the last couple of years, what's emerged in the conversation in the States about school shootings and rampage killings is that it's about guns and mental illness. Those are the two issues that come up over and over again. We live in a culture of washing guns, and we have a lot of mentally ill people and not, not enough good services. Well, guess what? Almost nobody thinks to ask in the mainstream conversation, if it's about guns and mental illness, then why don't girls and women commit 50% of the shootings? Because it's not about guns and mental illness. It's about gender, first and foremost, as it intersects with guns in some cases and mental illness in others. But if we don't talk about gender honestly, if we don't use the M word and talk about men and masculinities, we're not going to get anywhere. Now, is it anti-male to say any of this? I completely reject that idea, that it's anti-male to say anything that I've said or anything that I've really heard today that the idea that it's anti-male offends me. Is, is telling the truth anti-male? Is being honest discriminating against men? I don't think so. And let me also say, the same system that produces men who abuse women produces men who abuse other men. You know how many men are the victims of violence? You know how many men are the victims of other men's violence? 
whether it's murder, attempted murder, assault, aggravated assault, gay bashing, bullying. Men are the primary victims of all these crimes, as well as the primary perpetrators. And look at all the boys who have been traumatized by what adult men have done to their mothers and sometimes to themselves. Look at all the boys. Look at all the young men and boys across class, race, ethnicity, all over the world who have been traumatized by adult men's violence. Is it anti-male to call out adult men's violence and, and its contribution to these traumatic traumatized boys? I don't think so. In fact, I think it's an act of solidarity with young men and boys. And when I hear feminists criticize as anti-male, it is infuriating for me as a man and for a lot of other men as well as for women. Because it's factually incorrect and morally bankrupt to call the feminists who are standing up for justice, equality, and nonviolence, calling them bashing, bashers and man-haters is just to me... It's beyond the pale. Now, let me say, I know a lot of the women in this room have been called some of these names that, that feminists get called, right? Male basher, ball buster, feminazi. You have your own cultural and linguistic variations, right? And mo I, bet, I bet you a lot of women in this room have been called these names. You know what that's called? It's called kill the messenger, right? It's a... It's a it's a time-honored tradition when people are threatened by the message, they kill the messenger because if you write off the person presenting the ideas, then you don't have to engage with those ideas. That's one of the reasons why the term feminist has been so demonized by so many, because feminist ideas are challenging to traditional authoritarian political, economic, and social structures. And so, of course, you have to try to demonize the people who are making those arguments if you want to maintain the status quo. Now, I appreciate that women get called these names, and in spite of these names, and in spite of some of the pushback that feminists have gotten over the centuries, um, there's still all of you right here, and all of us in the greater world, and there's a lot of women who have refused to be silenced, which is a great thing. Uh, in fact, the feminist movement is one of the great movements in the history of our species, bar none. One of the great historical innovations of our species. But when men like myself speak out, we get some pushback too. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not all wine and chocolates, you know, for, 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 for men like me. I'm not going to equate what men like me get in terms of the backlash to what women get. But I have to say, there is backlash. And let me say, before I tell you what some of that backlash is towards men like myself, my experience in working with men, my colleagues' experience in working with men in multicultural, multiracial settings, including in sports arenas like we're in right now, I've been working in the heart of male culture for 25 years, in the military, in the sports culture, and other places. Most men, after they walk through, once they walk through the door, getting them through the door is the key, but once they walk through the door and hear and engage, don't get all hostile and, and aggressive against the kind of things that I've been saying. I'm just telling you my personal experience and my colleagues. Lots of men are ready to hear what I've been saying. Lots of men. Uh, and, and, and so when, I, when I'm about to characterize a small percentage of men, please don't think that I'm implying that all men can't handle this conversation, because it's not true. But there are some men who can't handle this conversation. So I'll just give you a handful of examples of the things that I've been called, because I think it makes a larger point. I'm routinely referred to as a mangina. You heard that one? Mangina. I'm, I'm routinely referred to as a beta male as opposed to an alpha male. So think about this. Some, some guy in the basement of his parents' home eating Cheetos and playing on his, typing on his computer keyboard calling me a beta male. I was recently referred to as Dr. Katz Strated. And I give that person high marks for creativity, if nothing else. But you notice a theme developing here? The theme is that I'm like a woman. Men like myself and other pro-feminist men are like women. Therefore, we don't have to listen to them in the same way the traditional patriarchal mindset has marginalized women's voices and women's ideas. We don't have to listen to them because they are women. Well, these guys are like women. Therefore, we don't have to listen to them. And more specifically, we don't have to listen to guys like me because I'm not a real man. I'm not a real man, so why would I have to listen to this, you know, why would have, we have to listen to this guy? He's not a real man. Now, happily, I'm a middle-aged guy. It's one of the few benefits of being a middle-aged person. But I don't care what some guy in his tip typing at his keyboard in the basement of his parents' house is calling me on the Internet. I don't care. I'm going to keep doing it. But guess what? A lot of men do care, and a lot of young men 
do care about what other guys think of them. And so what ends up happening is a lot of young men and men are policed into conformity with toxic ideas and ideologies of manhood because they're afraid that if they speak up, if they stand with women on issues like pornography, on issues like prostitution, on just basic issues of gender justice, that some other men will think that somehow they've gone soft or they're not one of the guys or they're a traitor to the home team or whatever it is. And a lot of guys say, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to take this risk. And so a lot of guys remain silent. And that's very sad, but it's one of the reasons why we need a whole lot more men, especially men with cultural, political, and social um, platforms, to start standing up and speaking out and say this stuff loudly. Because young men and other men need to hear men saying these things. And then young boys need to hear adult men saying that we stand with women, not against them. And we need to hear, boys need to hear men say that emphatically, not just in private, quietly, but from the public stage as well as in private relationships. Now... When I say we need a leadership, excuse me, a paradigm shift, and we have to understand these issues as men's issues, we also need to see these as leadership issues for men. And what do I mean by that? It, I mean that if you're a man and you're a leader in Swedish and Norwegian and Danish society and Icelandic society, anywhere really, if you're a man in your position of leadership, cultural, political, religious, business community, labor community, by definition of that leadership, you need to stand up and speak out and figure out how you can use your platform of influence to create a climate where abusive behavior, sexist abuse, heterosexist abuse is unacceptable. Not because you're a nice guy helping out the women, but because you're a leader and we expect that of our leaders. And we haven't gotten to that place yet. We haven't gotten to that place yet. People ask me, what would I do if I had the power on a university campus or in various communities? And and what would I do to change the the cultural climate around sexism and and men's violence against women? And I say, you know what? One of the first things that I would do is I would gather up the most powerful and influential men in that organization, in that institution, in that community, and have a training for those men. Because a lot of men make decisions, have power and make decisions about what happens in institutions and in communities have very little training, very little insight, very little understanding about all these issues. And yet women, who often have much more knowledge but not as much institutional power or cultural authority, get frustrated because they can't make the transformations that have to happen. And so I'm not, when I'm saying that we need to, to engage men in this, in this, it's not because men are the saviors who need to ride in. It's because men have power, and that power needs to be used in a constructive way. And if men in a democratic society have institutional leadership that we authorize them to have, and they're not addressing these issues, then they're not being good leaders, and we have to figure out how to pressure them and or replace them. Because if these are priorities, they're priorities. Um, I'm going to leave you with um, a quote from a famous uh, American, um, uh, Frederick Douglass, who was, a, who was born a slave. He became an advisor to President Lincoln, and he was also a prominent 19th century uh, supporter of women's rights. Frederick Douglass said, It's much easier to build healthy children than to repair broken men. It's much easier to build healthy children than to repair broken men. Well, as an educator, as a father of a son, as an activist, We need more men in the educational space, men and women working together on this, in creating educational initiatives for kids at all levels, age appropriate, where boys and girls, men and women, have an opportunity to have dialogue about all of this, have thoughtful conversations about all of it, learn from each other, and move forward. Nothing less, nothing less. This level of education should be in every school in Scandinavia and throughout the world. Every member of parliament should be trained in this. Every professional and every sports culture and every sports organization should have training in all of this. These are the beginnings of the cultural transformation that have to happen over the next number of years. And men and women have to be working together to make all that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And you just stay here. Yes, thank you so much. Now we will move to the panel discussion. And on this stage, I would like to present Kasia. And I would like to present Gail Dines as well. Please stand here. Thank you. Nice. And you just heard the really good speech that all three of them gave. And you gave some very interesting perspectives on discussing violence against women or violence, gender-based violence. Um, and, And the first question I would like to ask to you in what way do you see that the surrogate industry is a form of violence? Oh, I don't think it's a form of violence. <laughs> I don't know why they put it in this chapter. Um, I think we have to be very careful, you know, not to co- confuse 
rhetoric with definition. Sometimes we tend to overuse words because it sounds more dramatic, but you have to keep in mind, you know, what are you actually talking about, you know? And I don't think surrogacy is a form of violence explicitly mm -hmm. because it doesn't contain violence in the same way that prostitution does. What it is, it's a form of exploitation. Uh, it's a form of baby trade. It's a form of prostitution, but it's not necessarily a form of violence. And I think the same way also when people say, um, you know, prostitution is rape. I disagree with that, you know, because if you say that prostitution is the same thing as rape. You know, how can a prostitute say I was raped? You know, how do you make that distinction? Uh, I think prostitution is involuntary sex, but I think we have to be very careful with, you know, using words, mm -hmm. you know, not to uh, have an inflation in big words. So thank you for uh, doing this clarification. So my next question is, in what perspectives for the, what, what do you see uh, can be a new way or new action to, uh, to work against the surrogacy industry? Well, right now, the surrogacy industry is, is starting to form, you know, globally. You have in Sweden and in a lot of other countries in the West and in other parts of the world, um, you know, they're trying to open branches. Uh, they have seminars for everyone who, who's interested in, uh, in having a child through surrogacy. Uh, they have big conferences. They have their academics, you know, and so on. So they're forming. Unfortunately, like I said before, the people who are working against it were like 10 people. So um, really what we need is to form a, a counter movement, you know, and I think it's going to be historical in a sense when that starts happening. Uh, the people who form part of this, you know, you, you're going to become like part of something that later on you're going to look back and say, oh, you know, already then there was some resistance because right now in the press and sadly to say also in the feminist movement, um, there is a very naive idea about what surrogacy is. And I think part of the reason is because um, parts of the LGBT movement has framed surrogacy as a kind of progressive thing, you know? And I think here you have to be very careful not to conflate women's oppression with the gender or the sexuality of the person committing that mm -hmm. oppression, you know? Mm -hmm. We're not talking about who is buying a child through surrogacy, okay? We're not against that person. We're against the act of paying for a woman's body. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to ask you, what do you see as the link between the pornography industry and prostitution? Could you please elaborate on that? Okay, yes, certainly. And I'm going to begin by saying, actually, I, I disagree. I think prostitution is rape, and I don't think... Um, in any way that you can consent to being raped. And I think Rachel Moran, who's going to talk tomorrow, who is an exited woman, will talk about the fact that it doesn't matter how much they pay you, you're raped over and over again in the act of prostitution. I would like to also say, in terms of the connection, when you think about young men and they are being socialized through pornography, if you think that you've never had a history in your life of having sex with somebody, and then all you know is what you see in porn, the gagging, the rough anal sex, the spitting at her, the calling her names, you are going to be much more vulnerable to believing that that is true because you've got no reservoir to draw from. If you're a 30 odd year old guy and you've had sex with women, I'm um, assuming heterosexuality here, you can say, you know, I know women who don't like this. This doesn't make sense. If you are 11 or 12, you've got nothing to compare it to. Now, mm. when you go into the real world and start having sex, let me ask you, if you have been masturbating to industrial strength sex, what kind of sex are you going to want women to perform in your life? You want that industrial strength sex. And who are the only women at this moment who are going to agree to that? Those are women who can't say no. That is prostituted and trafficked women. Because if they say no, they'll get beaten to a pulp or murdered. So I think it's a major driver mm -hmm. to prostituted and trafficked women. Because asking a man who has been, a boy who has been using porn to go to so-called vanilla sex is like asking a whiskey drinker to go back to beer. It doesn't cut it. <laughs> Thank you. The next question, yes, the next question I want to ask you is how, it, how do we stop the porn industry shaping male and female sexuality and gender identity? Okay, well, I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow in the morning yeah. and also in the evening. I 
actually like what's called the Gulliver strategy. I am a lefty, as you can probably tell, okay? <laughs> I do not believe that corporations should have the absolute right to control our life. How do you limit corporate power? You do what's called the Gulliver strategy. You tie them down legislation by legislation by legislation. So one major way, mm -hmm. and I'll talk about this tomorrow, is that you come at them. You come at them. Death by a thousand cuts. The second way is you build a mass feminist movement. And when I say feminist movement, I don't mean this empowerment, I'm all right, fuck you movement. I mean the women's liberation movement that is not built on the most privileged women, but the argument that is if she's not okay, then I am going to build a movement that is going to make sure she's okay. So the only answer to this is a radical feminist movement that absolutely replaces the word empowerment with liberation. That's the feminism that I signed on to. And this is the way to go. Sorry? And this is the way to go. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, any other movement that basically collaborates with the pornographers mm. as a form of empowerment fantasy, you know, is a completely, as far as I'm concerned, waste of time. We've got to go to a movement that says basically to the, to the pornographers, you know what? You've had too much power. Your days are numbered. We're after you, so just watch out because we're coming at you. Thank you so Thank much. You. And now I will move to you. To what extent do you or should men be involved in this combating gender-based violence or working against gender-based violence? Sure. Well, one, one uh, sort of frame that I put on that particular question is if if you're working with women around these issues, it tends to be risk reduction. If you're working with men, it tends to be prevention. And so if you really want to do prevention, it's not, it's not like just a good idea to work with men. It's the fundamental idea. You have to work with men. And not just individual men, mm -hmm. but systems that are controlled by men and ideological systems and political systems that men have disproportionate power in. If you're not focusing on men and changing the cultural attitudes and beliefs and the socialization of boys that lead to these behaviors, then it's just cleaning up after the fact. So I think by definition, you, we, we have to work with men. And, and the work that I do and my colleagues have been doing for now a long time is trying to figure out how do you go into institutional cultures and change ideologies from, both from within and from without. It's a more complex you know, uh, dynamic. But that's why I work in the sports culture. That's why I work in the military culture. Hegemonic centers of power and ideology because if you're only on the margins, if we're only working with men who are already arrived at some kind of feminist sensibility, who are supporting women's organizations, women's centers, if you're only working with those men, you're not going to change the hegemonic culture. I mean, we're in a, on a stadium, we're in an arena that's probably filled on a regular basis, right? With people who aren't coming to feminist conferences, but they are coming, they're, they're part of the larger culture. And so I guess the, the big challenge is how do you, how do you, leverage in democratic societies the, 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 the points of entry into institutional life so that you can make transform, transform, transformative social change, in this case, in working with men. And, and one, one last thing, I, I just think it needs to be emphasized over and over again. It's not just out of altruistic concern for women that we need men engaged. We need men who are concerned about men, who are concerned with our fellow men and our sons. Because the culture is producing really dysfunctional men and boys on a regular basis. Gail's written about this for years. The pornography industry doesn't just hate women, it hates men too. And, and the, the level that, that men are degraded in the pornography industry, not the same, I'm not saying it's the same. But in the heterosexual pornography industry, they, they have contempt for men. They, and one of the reasons is they want men to be purchasers of their product. And so if men have healthy sexuality, they're not going to purchase those products. They don't want men to build healthy sexual identities and agency? Why, why would, that's against their self-interest. Can I just say to you, yeah. Jackson, as you well know, and as women well know, we are so fucking sick of cleaning up after men, you know? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have so had it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you agree. <laughs> and with this sentence in mind, I would actually like to ask you, um, what are your thoughts uh, about the so-called men's rights movement? Because I know we have discussed it earlier today. <laughs> yes, thank you. I say so, we, I'm glad you said so-called men's rights movement. I just want to say something brief about the men's rights movement. You, you familiar with the men's rights movement? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I have to think about what I say before I say it, because I don't want to reproduce some of the old 
traditional male um, aggressive attitudes because I'm so frustrated by these men. I'm so frustrated by the, the, the hate email that I get on a regular basis that other women get and men get just for saying the most basic things. You know, you, you give a speech that just says that men and women, men should treat women with respect and dignity. Women have the right to walk down the street without being assaulted verbally and sexually. You get attacked. Women get attacked on, verbally online or, you know, with, with, with nasty comments. Men like myself do by so-called men's rights types. And, 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 the, and the, the level of anger and aggression that's implicit and sometimes explicit in that mm. is it's power and control, it's violent. And, and I'm upset about it, and a lot of other men that I know are upset about it. The men's rights movement does not speak for me. It doesn't speak for most, the vast majority of men that I know who, who care about justice and freedom and equality and who don't see feminism as an attack on men, but as an advancement of the democratic project in human civilization. That's what feminism is. It's that basic. And when you attack feminists, you're attacking democracy. And I don't like people who attack democracy. <laughs> and by the way, can I just say one other quick thing? Anders Breivik, the Norwegian fascist who murdered 76 people, remember? A couple of years ago, of course you remember, was a men's rights fanatic. And, and Elliot Rogers, the, the, the deeply disturbed individual who murdered six people in Isla Vista, California, right down the street from my house three weeks ago, was a men's rights influenced fanatic. This is dangerous stuff. And when you, when you use hate language, when you aggress verbally and online against women, against feminists, against people like me, you're perpetuating a culture of violence and hate. And we need to call it out and challenge it whenever it comes up. And how do we do that? How do we challenge these men's rights movement? How do we challenge these fanatic people you mentioned here? How can we work with them? How can we approach them? You well, <laughs> so you can, you yeah, can. go. Okay. Um, well, first of all, not just talking about the men's rights movement. What I think we have to begin to do is to think about how, you know, we often tend to get depressed and overwhelmed as feminists mm. because, you know, men do have a tendency to fuck up just about everything they touch. What I would <laughs> argue is that I see increasingly now young women who are fed up. They really are. They're beginning mm. to speak in a different language. Now, I think it is incumbent upon us as feminists to start giving them frameworks and paradigms through which they can make sense of their lives. I can't tell you how many times I go into a college, and I'm Jack I know we've spoken about this, we have the same thing. You go in there and they are hungry for this. You cannot get out of the room. They are following me out of the door, begging for more, because nobody has come in, or very few, to say, to explain, this is why your life looks the way it does. This is why this creep who wants to come on your face, or he wants to do this, or wants to do that, is giving them a framework. And I think what's second Secondly, what's very important, and it's a challenge that I'm going to throw out to everybody here, is that the um, blogs and the so-called feminist sites have been colonized by the mainstream third-wave feminists. I think radical feminists have to start thinking about developing a website that is an answer to all this wishy-washy, mushy feminism that doesn't answer the questions. So I want people to start thinking about how we can develop a website with good articles, blog pieces, and analytical pieces, intellectual pieces, um, YouTube videos. And one of the things we're going to talk about in some of the workshops is how do we get this together on an international level? Thank you. And do you have any comments? Are you? Any comments to, to, for, for this question? On the website? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're welcome to join us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, no, but I agree with you. I mean, I think we're at a time, I don't know, uh, especially in Sweden where, you know, feminism has come to mean just about anything, you know, and uh, especially any woman that comes up and speaks publicly is by default labeled a feminist, yeah, you know, exactly. even though she has never said she is, oh, feminist speakers such as this one or that one, you know, who've never fought for women's rights, mm -hmm. you know, and I think like nowadays when you don't really know what it means, it's important to bring it back to, you know, what are we actually fighting for? Um, because it's funny, like, especially now in Sweden, we have the feminist party coming up and a lot of people are, are sensing, you know, the trend and joining the trend and feeling like, oh, I'm going to jump on this train. And um, not anyone, you know, in, like, unlike other movements, you know, I mean, I could not join, for example, a left-wing Marxist movement and say, you know, I'm a real Marxist, but I do believe in the right of capitalists to exploit labor, but I'm still a Marxist. You have certain yeah. things you have to agree on. That does mean, and I would say, you can join the feminist movement and say, I'm a feminist and I'm actually pro-prostitution and pro-pornography and that still makes me a feminist. Well, no, I'm sorry. There's yeah. certain things here. Mm. And the key thing <laughs> right, is that anything that hurts women, anything that hurts women 
is anti-woman and anti-feminist. And not everybody should be allowed to claim this movement. We worked hard to build this movement. We shouldn't be so quick to give it away, which is what I think is happening, especially mm. in the United States of America. Hmm? You have the last yeah. word. Thank you. Well, just, just building on the, 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 thank you, Gail. The earlier uh, discussion about men's rights, I think more men need to stand up and say, these men do not speak for me. They, they, tr they claim to speak for men, somehow men are being oppressed. And if men who don't agree with them don't speak up, then they come to speak for us. And one of the things that I do in my work, in, my, in the schools, in the sports culture, in the military, is I, I and my colleagues uh, pioneered this approach called the bystander approach to uh, prevention of sexual violence and domestic violence. And what that does is engages everybody in a peer culture, not just perpetrators and victims. So when it, for example, when we're talking about working with men, we're not just focusing on what men need to not do to women. We need, we're, we're, we're focusing on what guys can do to challenge and interrupt their friends and, and their peers and their, and their colleagues when they're acting out in sexist or abusive ways. Because the reason, the reason why that's so important is that a lot of men will say, well, listen, I'm not a rapist. I don't abuse well, women. This isn't my problem. It's not my issue. Have you heard men say this? I mean, this is what most men say. And, and my response to that is, the first response is, you know, they'll, they'll say, I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. This is not my problem. We'll say, the fir my first response is, um, we need to raise the bar a little higher for what it means to be a good guy. And just saying, I'm not a rapist is not enough, okay? <laughs> just, and, Thank you. And, and one last thing. And... We need more men who have the courage and the strength and the self-confidence and sometimes the moral integrity to break our complicit silence and take some risks finish, within male yeah. culture yeah. and say some of these uncomfortable things within male culture. Some of your guys courage. are going to be upset with okay. you. But, you, but, but, if, but if, you, if you really are dedicated to justice and fairness and equality, then you're going to take some of those risks. And I think the courage is really crucial, because I want to say the one thing that, I, well, one, many, many things Andrea Dworkin said that were brilliant, but the, she said that, you know what, the one thing that women need to build a feminist movement is the one thing that patriarchy destroys in women, and that's courage. And I think the only way that we can develop courage is collectively as a feminist movement with men who are also pro-feminist who are going to help us, because this is going to take an act of absolute courage to fight the misogynists and the capitalists and the racists and all of them because they're all in one big mess and we're going to have to fight a lot of them. But you don't think like, well, we, you know, one thing that I've thought about, you know, the men's rights movement, it's a very, you know, contemporary thing in a sense that it's inverted feminist movement rhetorically. You know, the way they speak, exactly what you were saying before, you know, the man is the neutral gender. You never hear him coming out saying I'm a man. Well, this is what that movement does. You know, it's kind of making men visible as a gender in a sense. And what it also does, you know, is, is taking all the feminist rhetoric and turning it around. So all of a sudden, these men, that's why I think it's so paradoxical about that movement, you know. It's saying that men, we're the victims, we're the victims of abuse, you know, we're so oppressed, we're like down here. And, you know, they're, they're acting like the opposite way, you know, from a typical man, in a sense. Do you I, see what I mean? I like, they're, they're acting as if... Um, they, they want to, like, raise up the, the man again to the male role, but in a sense, they're acting just the opposite. Yes. But the problem with the men's rights movement is they blame women and feminists for their problems rather than a hierarchical male-dominated system that produces so, much of the, so many of the problems that they claim to have in the first place. Especially they, they capitalism. Blame it on, they blame it on women. But what's your analysis of why it's come up right now? Is it an economic thing or is it a reaction to feminism? It's a re oh, it's a reaction Both. to feminism. As, as women have pushed forward, they push back. That's what and I think. it's also the fact that, remember, we live in a society where increasingly men have been socialized into breadwinners are becoming obsolete, and instead of going after the 1% capitalists who are destroying the, all of us, they come after women. They right. look down and they beat us to death rather than going after the people they should be going after, which is looking up at the privileged people who have actually taken away the capacity for many, many, many men and women to live a life of dignity and to live a life free from want. Thank you so much to all of three of you. We have come to an end with this Thank panel you. discussion and we just got it started and then we have to end it. It's always like that. Thank you. First of all, I would like to give you a flower as a oh. thank for participating. Thank you so much. And I would like to 
thank all thank of you. you in the audience as well so for we being here. So we get the pink here. when it gets <laughs> the yellow. You don't think that's oh, typical? Oh, I, I wasn't actually thinking about no. it. <laughs> I like pink. So, but you, you can switch if you want. <laughs> well, I would like to say thank you for participating in this workshop both the, all the speakers and all of you audience. I think we had had some two very good hours exploring how we can see new action, go new path to, uh, to, to work against violence against women. And we have seen very uh, different perspectives on this uh, matter. So thank you very much. We'll go to a break, 10 minutes break now, and then the next session will start. Thank you.